Welcome, everybody. We'll give just a couple of seconds for people to get into the meeting. The spirit here is lightning talks, so we'll be going quickly. Uh, we want to give the maximum amount of time, and it's not a lot of time, for each of our presenters. I'm going to start by introducing John Gabrielli, who's a faculty director, along with Parag Pathak. John is a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and Parag is a professor in the Department of Economics, and jointly there are faculty directors. John, to you. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks to you and, and Steve for organizing uh, all, the entire program as well as the session for today. We're super excited to have a quick review of the research progress that's been in, uh, supported by the Mightily Research Grants. Uh, the, the variety will, it will be great, the speed will be great, uh, and we're delighted that this program is enhancing the opportunities for researchers across the MIT community to improve research in relation to education and education outcomes. Uh, one of the exciting things about Mightily is that it spans the entire MIT community uh, in terms of levels of researchers from graduate students to professors and in terms of all kinds of different areas of inquiry. And we're super excited to get this uh, lightning fast review of the research progress. And with a note that a lot of this has been spectacularly hard in this era of COVID pandemic restrictions and, and challenges. So uh, this research is hard enough to do to start with, but it's been accomplished uh, in, in a very difficult period and, and all, all the more uh, kudos to the to, to you all who, who did this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. I'm very happy to present the results of our research. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Excellent. So um, our project, uh, our project started in 2018 and ended in February 2020. Uh, um, I have the fortune to work with Dr. Ima Borrella, Dr. Sergio Caballero, and Dr. Chris Kaplis in this research. So our main goal was to reduce dropout in massive open online courses. So as you can see, a dropout this is definitely a problem in most of the massive open online programs. And just to share with you some of the relevant data, in our courses, on average, we have about 16,000 people who are registered in our courses. However, uh, verified students are about 1,500. Uh, 1,200 of them are completers, and about 1,000 passed the course and earn the certificate. So as you can see on average in all of the courses we have been running and so far we have been running about 50 instances of different supply chain courses, the dropout rate is about a 35% if we take into consideration our verified students. So this is the, our, the focus of our research on what we will try to do here is to first to predict which learners will drop out um second thing and very important is how to intervene how we can reduce the dropout rate what are the things we can do in order to convince our uh, our learners to continue with the course and complete the course so this is what we cover here so first what we did is a predictive model we look at the data we have we applied a, a couple of techniques we focus on random forest and logistic re regression um, uh, with the results we were able to have a very accurate model and we were able to predict three out of four dropouts in our courses. The most relevant predictors were the grades and the time the students spent in our courses. Um, we use recall to assess the model. Um, uh, the accuracy of the model was almost 100%, uh, was really, really uh, um, very accurate model. So predicting is one part, and it's a very important part, of course, but it's not enough to reduce the dropout. So in the second part of the, of the project, what we did is try to design interventions, trying to design experiments that will help our learners to continue with our courses. So uh, we analyze a couple of factors, personal factors, and institutional factors. Regarding the personal factors, we uh, look into the motivation and the self-efficacy. 
Um, then we also look into some levers like support and content. These are the dimensions we take into consideration in our model. So we define uh, different interventions. We define motivational emails, we define exam preparation materials to, ta uh, to tackle motivation and self-efficacy. In terms of the content, in terms of the content, we focus on one intervention in order to incorporate gradual increase of difficulty in the different exams and tests we were providing to our learners. And the second thing is we were trying to improve the content of those challenging materials. Those materials that we identified were really challenging for our learners. In terms of the, uh, what we discovered with this research, uh, unfortunately, those interventions that we define to provide support to our learners, like the motivational emails, did not have any effect on our dropout. However, those interventions that focus more on the content uh, did have um, uh, an impact in order to reduce the dropout rate. So these were our main takeaways from our research. We were able to publish uh, the results in the uh, Learning at the Scale conference in 2019, and I'm very happy to announce that we are now in the second round of review for a paper in computers and education. We were also able to present in different conferences and share our uh, takeaways with the different uh, academic uh, and researchers. Uh, if you want to learn more, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Ima Borrella, uh, she will be also available to, to clarify any additional questions. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, thank you for having me and thank you for the attention. Hopefully there's something interesting uh, me and my team had, our original study was to look at what happens when we add computational things, visualizations and coding into introductory physics courses to understand if we could affect learner outcomes um, in actual knowledge acquisition. Um, so this was a four, four week long uh, physics class that was online open to global learners. And we were, intervening in each one of the week's homework assignments by adding some type of a, a different intervention. So some students did math by hand, some students coded math, some students had been given interactive visualizations that they could play with. Um, and, and we cohorted them, we added them into a group and they went through all four weeks getting one particular type of intervention. And then we tried to study if any one of those groups did differently. Um, I'll tell you up front, we didn't get st statistically significant results, but I still think we learned an incredible amount about how to manage such experiments, including the fact that in online courses like this one, uh, students can enroll after other students. So, so once the course has begun, somebody can come in in week two, they still have to complete the earlier weeks, but we need to have already cohorted everyone who enrolled in week one. So this on the fly cohorting in order to randomize the groups um, was something that we put a lot of effort into. And if you want that uh, knowledge transfer, reach out and we can help you understand how to keep valid experimental design in an actively enrolling study. So here are some little visualizations. Uh, everything is in inverted color perhaps because I use my computer in inverted color. So forgive the strange colors if it's uncomfortable. Um, so on the left, it was just coding challenges that some groups were given. On the right, it's a interactive visual thing. So it's some type of a plot or an animation. On the bottom right, there's a non-visual interactive component. So this is like a table of numbers that changes as you move sliders. And on the very bottom, in order to manage uh, time on task and to normalize whatever confounding factors we can, uh, we gave some students some, th some thought experiments. Just think about these things. Don't do math, don't code, don't look at interactive things. Just think about this stuff. Um, so we used a two by two factorial design in order to study this. We had a control group that did standard physics problems, uh, a group that got programming and visualization, a group that got programming 
and non-visual interactives, a group that got the questions to help people think about the problems and visualizations and questions and non-visualizations. Um, here are the results. The stars that you see here are things that I think are interesting that should be explored more, but they are not statistically significant. So uh, the first, so so down the very far left column, you'll see the groups. Um, in the top, it's the actual conditions that I just talked about. And then each one of the columns to the right is their score on a standardized assessment that's been vetted and proven to be at least trusted and accepted by the community as a measure of one's physical understanding of the world, one's spatial intelligence, or one's understanding of computer science. Um, the, the two stars that are on this top pane, I find kind of interesting. So the, the programming seemed to help, the programming and the non-visual seemed to have not helped as much with spatial understanding, which would make sense. There's no visualization. Um, nor no conceptual visualization in the mind due to pondering questions. And the questions and the visualization seem to have helped with computer science, which is pretty, nah, that's why it's not statistically significant. So these are the dangers of these numbers. So, so luckily we've run our ANOVAs and we know that they're not statistically significant, but I will always like to point out that even when things look interesting, you know, look, look behind the hood. Um, Yes, so, so visualization, if we group the two groups that had visualization to normalize out the programming part, it seems like that may have had some slightly bigger impact, although not statistically significant yet. Our numbers were smaller than expected um, on physics and spatial comprehension, spatial intelligence. Um, so I don't know, it, it's something, it's promising. We, we at least have some machinery working. And then if we look at the uh, learning outcomes of the students in the actual course, um, the thing that gets a star as interesting but not statistically significant is that the questions and the non-visualization, so, so the sort of mo the least engaging of our interventions as an educational designer would say, uh, seem to at least show some minor signal that that may have been the most effective on course outcome, maybe because it gave time for students to do other things, uh, like spend time working on their P sets and homework problems. So it's something to consider as you intervene in educational systems. Are you drawing time away from other tasks that might actually be helpful? Um, so, and the last thing I wanted to close on is that I have some other ongoing related things. Um, so I've been using artificial intelligence to analyze the discernibility of tactile graphics for visually impaired blind learners. Um, I've been sonifying data in order to help make multimodal more engaging versions of black hole simulations. Um, I've been producing some eight channel spatialized audio, mostly for wonderful social emotional learning and engagement, especially at the end of the pandemic and comparing some human psychophysics of facial recognition under non-ideal situations to artificial intelligence systems. If any of those pique your interest, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to chat. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, hi everyone. Uh, I am joined here by Patty Myers, professor at uh, Media Lab, and I would like to present our work on Attentive View, evaluating the effectiveness of real-time biofeedback to monitor and improve ability to sustain attention. As we are very limited on time, uh, I do encourage you, if you have any questions, please send us an email. So just to position us uh, in this within a very short time frame, I will first present you the hardware because our project does involve heavily very specific hardware. Uh, it's a system we have designed four or five years ago at the lab called AttentiView, and it's a pair of glasses that can measure the brain activity of a person. You can see this electrodes named as electroencephalography or EEG uh, just on the sides of the uh, pads uh, around the 
ears, and we can also pick up the eye movements of the person using the sense and modality called electroculography or EOG. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this does not involve any microphones or cameras whatsoever. And we are also uh, able to provide a feedback in real time, either context based, but also on device itself, meaning that we can provide uh, sound or haptic feedback uh, if there is, for example, some changes in cognitive activities. So this is how the system looks like on one of the users. And we have done over past several years multiple uh, things with TNT view. We can measure attention, auditory, visual, internal, external, engagement, fatigue, drowsiness, and cognitive performance. There is a lot of prior work actually on specifically using biofeedback, meaning giving a feedback to the user about their cognitive state in real time or offline. For example, for sustaining attention, also that this biofeedback can improve performance outcomes in the classroom settings, and that brain sensing is actually suitable for classroom activities and improves academic performance outcome. And I'm not gonna go into depth about how we are doing that. I do encourage you to check the papers or send us an email, but we are basically using um, different formulas that are provided by the state of the art and we have derived some of them as well, particularly the brain installations, uh, different alpha, beta, theta uh, bands and also eye movements. So the amount of blinks, saccade movements you are doing while you are working. Just as an example, when you are very focused on a task, for example, you really look right now on my slides, you would try to kind of stare a bit and you will blink a bit less than if you're actually bored. So just to give you an example. So what is actually, what is the difference? You might have heard about use of biofeedback and the devices that include brain sensing, like our system. But what is uh, different in our approach is that we use a, this closed loop real-time biofeedback in the context of actual homework. So usually in the state of the art, the, there is a proposed like little video game that is used. So it's usually not actual task that is being targeted, but just something else that is designed to help target and improve attention. So we are trying to target the actual homework so the user uh, will actually do what they're supposed to do and use our system in the context of the task. And we obviously want to expand a lot of this research is presented using populations who are having uh, ADD or ADHD, but we try to really expand it further um, for uh, children and young adults. So for the recruitment, we are looking at 45 participants ages 12, 18, with a biofeedback group, random feedback and controls. We already did some of these studies, so because obviously it's very important, maybe just the presence of the device itself, you know, will actually uh, spike the attention. So maybe we don't need to give like actual measurements. Um, uh, we are looking at doing a one hour session approximately for three times a week over a period of uh, eight weeks with uh, tasks that are uh, pretty regular, like watching the videos that was assigned as a homework or uh, and reading tasks. So it's either two videos or two reading tasks or video and reading depending on the assigned homework. We uh, were important cannot really go again in the depths of the whole protocol, but we do calibration. It's a very common question we are getting. So each time you are put in the device, there is a calibration. It's personalized. It's every day. I mean, every day when you use the device, it is very short, but it will allow for high uh, precision for our ML model. So there is a multiple tasks, for example, go, no go tasks, moving, uh, moving object tracking task, resting and back tasks. So basically you would need to click on some items. You would need to, we will measure the speed. Um, is it correct and correct, etc. So this is a whole pipeline, which is pretty short, but personalized it's like little mental brain games, I, I would call them. And this would allow for this collaboration because what if, you know, you had a, not a very good night, you know, you didn't sleep enough and you're just tired. We're not gonna do a generalized model. We will basically adjust the model and adjust the scores that are match, that are matching your current state. And we are looking at a lot of things to in evaluation, specifically in objective performance metrics to measure the learnability of the material presented, well, quizzes and uh, con uh, content related questions, but also subjective feedback, obviously, from the participants, from the caregivers, from the teachers. And we are looking at academic performance before, during, and after the intervention. Um, and we have multiple goals, obviously, in the project. 
uh, we would love to demonstrate if the students can improve the ability to sustain attention, test our biofeedback, and if it actually can improve the learning performance, verify if the learn-term use of the system would result in any improved engagement level when the system potentially and will not be in use anymore, which is very, very important. We don't envision it to be worn all the time at home, but actually rather really more at time when you need it. And actually investigate finally if the biofeedback would, uh, the triggered by drops of engagement will keep users' attention higher uh, and over longer periods of time. We obviously, because this project is hardware related, we were particularly hit by COVID as John did mention in the beginning, with obviously a huge, you might see still ongoing supply chain permutations. However, however, we did a pre-study one, it is published. It You can see the photo on the right. It is, as you have guessed, no masks on that photo. It is pre-COVID where we actually managed to do three classes over a period of three weeks. Uh, it's a science class with the teacher, measure performance before, during, and after eight weeks uh, after the intervention happened. And now we are working on having actual in-home, so shipping the devices as MIT now allows for these protocols to be in place. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Dushita. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, at MIT CCL with Professor Stephanie Mueller. And a lot of my projects are focused on learning of skills. And I'm presenting here the first um, set of projects um, that were funded by uh, Mitli. Um, so the first project is focused on adaptive learning of motor skills. Um, uh, we published two papers related to this work. The first one was focused on studying if um, adaptive tools, physical adaptive tools, uh, whether they can help in motor skill training or not. And the second uh, paper that was published was focused on um, building systems and designing tools for uh, learning of different motor skills. So the idea of adaptive uh, motor skills is um, something that's demonstrated by this prototype that we built, which was, for example, while learning uh, basketball, um, we built this adaptive basketball tool uh, that kind of senses how the player is performing and adjust the hoop uh, size. So it reduces and increases the hoop width and also increases and reduces the hoop height uh, based on how the uh, learner is performing. So as the learners get better at their skills, the task, um, the tool sort of adapts to make the task harder and harder, kind of taking the learner from a beginner level to an expert level, while always maintaining the difficulty level at an optimal challenge point, which is when the difficulty is never too easy nor too hard for the learner. And the reason why we keep the difficulty at an optimal challenge point is because studies have shown that maintaining difficulty tasks at, um, at this, like neither too easy nor too, um, hard um, sort of like optimal level leads to higher learning gains. Oops. So uh, we conducted a bunch of uh, user studies where we used this adaptive prototype and tested uh, for learning gains in uh, various conditions. So the first study was focused on non-adaptive versus adaptive mode. And then the second one was um, uh, in the condition of manually adaptive versus auto-adaptive mode. And uh, our study sort of showed that, you know, we are, we as human learners are really bad at assessing our own skill levels and knowing what level uh, to set our difficulty training to achieve, uh, to achieve maximum learning gains. Um, so we always often tend to uh, under challenge ourselves or over challenge ourselves. And our studies kind of showed that in both the studies in both the conditions, um, uh, auto-adaptive mode led to higher learning gains. Uh, but in addition to just the learning gains, uh, there was some interesting feedback from the learners as well, where uh, it turns out that the participant kind of found it more trusting um, to use the auto-adaptive training mode. And they also sort of thought it was easier and they felt more relaxed because they did not have like a personal coach sort of like over, um, over their shoulders, uh, kind of like assessing them. So that was something very interesting. 
um, we were very like motivated by this idea and we sort of expanded this idea of like uh, learning motor skills using adaptive tools and uh, conducted um, uh, a, a bunch of like um, conducted a workshop where students um, built these different uh, tools that range from adaptive floaty for learning to swim versus uh, this adaptive piano. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, this adaptive glove that is used to teach uh, sign language um, and this uh, adaptive skateboard that changes its uh, length based on how the learner is uh, performing or like learning to skate. And one of my other personal favorites is uh, learning to sort of walk in heels where the heels uh, the height of the heels increases as you learn uh, to walk in, in, in higher heels. Um, but through this workshop, we not only like proved that, oh, there are all these like different um, designs that could be built. We also um, use this workshop to teach students the idea of uh, building these like adaptive tools and also identify where it is challenging to design these adaptive uh, tools. And um, based on those findings, we, um, we built uh, two systems. So one was a user interface to configure the learning algorithm for design of these like several, several um, uh, adaptive tools. And then the second one was a visualization tool that can help the learner sort of assess and visualize how they're performing and whether the uh, tool is adapting based on their learning or not. And if you are, if any of this work interests you or if you find it exciting or if you have any, any ideas related to it, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk. Um, thank you so much. These projects were divided into two papers. So the first one was published this year at the ACM Creativity and Cognition uh, Conference. And the second one is submitted to ACM CHI um, uh, for CHI 2022. Um, the first project focused mainly on the design of system of building um, uh, building a system that can help us fabricate objects from games. And the idea behind this was that the games, the world of games already has these digital assets of objects and uh, characters. And uh, what we thought was, why not use these, why not fabricate these uh, characters and use this fabrication process to teach kids how to learn fabrication and maker skills. Um, so the first project focuses on building the system that allows this to be um, possible. So allows us to like uh, build fabrication files on the go. And then the second one focuses on framework for to help educators kind of identify which moments in the games are suitable for learning. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, the, the world of games already has these like uh, characters uh, sort of embedded in it. So for example, uh, imagine if you catch a, a Pokemon while playing, um, uh, catch a Pikachu while play, playing Pokemon Let's Go. And every time a kid catches a, a Pokemon, they can fabricate that. So the one on the left is like, uh, you know, like if you catch a Pikachu, you can actually laser cut it and you can have your own uh, Pokemon. Uh, and then the second one is where, uh, while let's say, for example, while playing the game um, Legend of Zelda, you uh, identify or you capture this, this uh, unique sword, you can actually fabricate it and use it as a game controller. Um, and like I mentioned, we built an interface which uses computer vision uh, to kind of capture these uh, online, uh, sorry, these um, game characters and game objects and allows uh, the, the players to sort of like generate fabrication files on the go. And in the interest of time, uh, I will not go into the demo for, uh, for this tool, but the idea is you can take an existing games and the designers or educators can identify which moments in the games are good to let their players fabricate objects. And then when the players um, sort of play these objects, uh, so play the game, they can fabricate these objects on the go. Uh, we conducted two user studies for this, and here are some of the outcomes from the first user study. 
where you know a range of a wide range of objects were fabricated for example this um uh, uniquely designed skateboard in in tony hawks or this axe from minecraft um or this custom design dress from animal crossing or all the planes that the players had destroyed in in this game like war of thunder so there are all these opportunities that you know, with it that exist in in existing digital games that can be used to teach fabrication um, we also conducted a second user study to identify the experience of playing and fabricating objects. And because of COVID, this was really hard to do it in person. So we did it uh, over Zoom. So the, the way this was set up was the players played an online game um, and via Zoom's uh, remote control. And then they operated the paper cutter, which was on my desk via Zoom to fabricate these uh, objects, which are like these Pokemon objects that they captured in the game. Um, and uh, as um, you know, as sort of expected, um, a lot of players really enjoyed this act of like, you know, fabricating, but not only that, they also found the potential of using this um, interface and this UI as an educational tool, especially to get kids excited about fabrication um, and sort of like teaching uh, value, teaching valuable skills um, uh, in STEM. Uh, we are now extending these uh, these two set of projects further, um, where the first stage of this uh, extension is where we have interviewed educators across uh, different maker space maker spaces in Cambridge Boston area. So, for example, Nuvu in Cambridge and. Um, the art, which is art resource collaboration for kids and innovators for purpose in Boston. Uh, we've interviewed around seven to eight um, educators to identify uh, what are really the pain points in, in uh, while teaching these maker skills and how can our interface, our FABO can sort of help them um, uh, uh, sort of resolve those, those, those issues. Uh, the next step is to co-design a game with these educators for their students. And then the third uh, part of the uh, this extension would be to run a study with the students to kind of like see how our interface leads to um, higher learning gains in, in like learning of fabrication skills and maker skills. Um, and finally, we are also conducting a workshop at, um, at Kai this year where we are bringing in experts from systems designs in uh, who mainly focus on systems for fabrication and maker skills and bringing in experts from learning sciences to kind of this bridge this gap between design of systems to enable learning of uh, fabrication and maker skills. And if you are, if any of this work interests you or if you find it exciting or if you have any, any ideas related to it, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, Steve, John, and Parag for your leadership of Mightily. If this hypothesis is true, that by immersion in novelty, you can upregulate plasticity, then perhaps even in the classroom setting, you could potentially enhance learning outcomes by having the students experience phases of novelty. Um, so that's the title of our work, Enhancing Learning by a Novelty Insertion. And this is the wonderful team that I had the good fortune of, of working with. Um, Annie, Matt, Anna, that Kyle had mentioned uh, in his talk. Uh, Lara, Sid, who just celebrated his 95th birthday. Ricardo uh, and yours truly. So here's our experimental design. We decided to take a MOOC and uh, quite appropriately, we chose the MOOC taught by John, Intro to Psychology 900. We broke it up into pieces and we then inserted uh, novel videos, so very short clips of novel videos or not so novel videos, familiar videos. Um, so a student or a, a participant in our study would experience this whole lecture by John um, on material that uh, presumably is new to them. Um, but 
this video would be interspersed with either novel video clips or familiar video clips. The novel clips were about interesting animals in the wild, uh, true facts videos in case uh, you want to check them out on YouTube. And the familiar videos were about <laughs> a woman describing how to go about cleaning your kitchen or cleaning your, your room, which turned out to be a somewhat of an unfortunate choice, as I, as I, as I will mention. So this is group one. So group one is first experiencing the novel insertions and then the familiar insertions. And just to make sure that there wasn't an ordering effect, we also had another group that first experienced the familiar insertions and then the novel insertions. And what we did was to then follow up this experience with an assessment period where the students would be assessed on material that had either followed the novel insertions or the material that had followed the familiar insertions. Um, we additionally recorded uh, ECG and uh, galvanic skin response while the, the students were, were going through this regimen. We had 47 subjects, 10 of them participated as pilot participants, 37 as uh, participants in the actual study, and the reason I've broken this up into 25 plus 12 is because 12 of them, unfortunately, fell asleep during the experiment. So we did not include their data. So the pilot participants, we had allowed to have coffee before they came into our lab. And then we decided, no, let's, let's skip coffee. And that had these adverse outcomes where a third of our uh, participants fell asleep during the study. Um, so these are the kinds of raw data we collected, uh, uh, cardiac, uh, EEG, uh, EOG, and GSR. And the results, uh, in, without going into the details, contrary to our expectations, the novel videos did not elicit significantly different physiological responses from the cleaning the kitchen videos. So galvanic skin response and ECG metrics were pretty much indistinguishable between the two. And it was only post hoc when we were analyzing the data that we realized that for MIT students, perhaps the videos about cleaning the kitchen <laughs> are just as novel as videos about uh, echidna or the uh, star-nosed uh, mole. Um, so slightly unfortunate, which perhaps masked the effects of novelty versus familiarity. But to our pleasant surprise, even with this uh, reduced distinction between novel and familiar insertions, we still saw that subjects performed marginally better on material that followed novel insertions versus material that followed familiar insertions. And furthermore, this advantage of novelty was specially apparent for material that was presented within eight minutes of a novel insertion. So this brings up some very interesting ideas about how long the effect of novelty lasts, uh, two minutes of a novelty insertion, how long the effects of the increased plasticity might last. So just to, to conclude, uh, this project, it allowed us to, to make some advances on a very interesting question, uh, both fundamentally and also from an applied perspective. And even though the results are still in the works, uh, we need to increase the number of participants, increase the distinction between familiar and novel videos. I think the results already hold promise and deserve further investigation. And thank you again to Mike Lee for supporting this work.
Yeah, thank you for the intro. Hi, everyone. So our team at Media Lab is working on dialogic core reading interaction to help improve parent to child conversational turn takes. And our uh, team consists of our PhD student, Huili Che, and our postdoc, uh, Sharifa, and Cynthia and I at Media Lab. Um, so if we really think about it, at a very young age, um, before reading age, you know, if we think about it, like no one starts to like learn things by reading and writing, right? So everyone starts to learn things by socially interacting with others, um, building relationships. So it's like a highly social event that happen to, to foster young children's learning. And um, that's where we got the motivation of using social AI agents in the picture of intelligent Turing system. And what further motivated our work was uh, John's group's work on how the conversational uh, turn takes between the child and the people around the child is like the most significant factor in their language development. Unlike, you know, previous research is showing that it was like, it depends on the exposure of how many words like children are exposed to, right? So, uh, my Tilly first supported this work in the collection of uh, parent to child conversation data set while they are doing story reading together. And from then on, we actually came a long way using that data set to, to develop like new algorithms, but also then to, to develop the triadic interaction involving the agent to support the parent and child's interaction during story time. And eventually we want to then you, you know, develop a personalized agent that can support the most beneficial interaction between specific parent and child pair. And then even analyzing and tracking the effect of the, the agent mediated interaction in the parent and child's like everyday context and how their dialogue and conversation changes. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'll like dissect our uh, milestones. So first we started with the, with the MyTilly seed grant to collect data sets on parent and children having story time together. And during that time uh, with that data set, we, we analyzed um, depending on their self-report like demographics and also like parenting, uh, parenting style and parenting stress scale and, and child temperament scale, like what correlations we could find uh, to like those survey data to how they actually engage with each other in the story time. And using that data set, uh, we have developed, uh, for example, affect prediction algorithms. So like predicting affect from the parent and the child. Uh, then also then using that to develop a triadic interaction uh, study that kind of we changed the robust role from uh, providing a modeling role to the parent. So the parent can like learn uh, what kind of questions that she, she or he can engage with their children, um, but also a robot making some of those suggestions for the parent and the child to have a, a conversation amongst them. And we've been so far analyzing the newly collected data on how the robot mediated triadic interaction uh, affects the conversation between the parent and the child. Um, so let me first talk about the data set we collected. So we invited the parent and child pairs to the lab uh, twice. And in between, we sent a LENA device for them to record uh, certain uh, a portion of their daily conversation um, at home. Uh, so, so far we've used the lab collected data to analyze their verbal and nonverbal cues uh, during the story time interaction. So this is a very extensive data set that uh, that the paper is currently under review, but it's a very extensive data set that includes the demographic profiles of the pair, um, but also the, the child's temperament and behavior questionnaire scale, the parents' parenting style and parenting stress scale, um, as well as all the nonverbal cue uh, uh, extraction of like, for example, their body pose, uh, their gaze, um, their acoustic features, their affect, uh, like human annotated arousal and valence level. Um, and we are sharing these, and we have like seven different camera views. So we are, we are sharing all of that uh, with this data set. Um, on this data set, we also analyzed, um, like uh, some, we ran some correlation study of how the number of cues are correlated to 
uh, these pairs like specific you know parenting style child's temperament and also how their reading behavior like for example how many conversations or turn take they have during story time like who's reading and, and in, in what portion of the time and things like that and all of those uh, uh set analysis is now data uh, data set paper so i won't go to details on the analysis but i'll show you some snippets of our data set So we had 34 parent-child pairs, um, and we had in total 65 interaction sessions. So this is only the sessions that we conducted in the lab, which we have then the whole video data as well as along with the audio data. David, and these are the seven the views of the video and one. synchronized audio with the, the seven video one. views. Okay. The movie is following, following you, you think so? I'll skip and show you some of the reading behavior data that we analyzed. So we analyzed uh, the annotated for when the parent is speaking, uh, whether the parent is reading a book, when the child is reading a book, also when they're conversing. I don't know. It doesn't look like Harry. Harry gave up and walked slowly toward the gate, but suddenly he stopped. Ever we also seen. have annotations oh, for the valence and arousal level of each parent and child. The weather and we also have, you know, a tracking of the parent and the child, and also their body poses as well. And using this data set, we further conducted some algorithmic advancements. Uh, for example, this work was only using speech data, if whether we could uh, actually predict the, the arousal and valence level of the parent and the child. So here, what we did was we developed three models. Like first one is the baseline where we, uh, so, so the difference between these three models is in the pooling layer that is highlighted with a green box. Uh, so the baseline model was just using a mean pooling, uh, which like calculates the mean value over time on the, the recurrent neural nets output. Uh, the right to uh, uh, attention, like local attention augmented models, use a weighted pooling layer that computes a weighted sum of the RNN. But I won't go into details about the approach, but we analyzed and, and, and ran a test with the collected data set that I just uh, uh, presented on. And we show that, that predicting the, the arousal level of the parent and child was like significantly better than the baseline, um, but a lot aligned with the prior literature, uh, we fa also found out that predicting valence, though uh, you know sometimes it worked decently, uh, didn't work really well with just only speech data, which just motivating us more to work on multimodal data set. Uh, but this work was a was a quite quite good work in terms of its byproduct as well. So it, so as a byproduct. We actually could develop a good diarization rhization algorithm where we can understand where the portion of the child's speech and the portion of the parent's speech. Um, so by by predicting the arousal and valence when their their arousal and valence level is high, uh, we could actually then understand when each when the child and the parent was speaking. So this was a, a really good byproduct in terms of uh, advancing to our next set of works. So in this work, we implemented an agent that could support the parent and child's story time. So here, the motivation is that not all parents have equal access to resources of how to engage with their child and how to converse with their children, right? Um, so, so in this body of work, we wanted to kind of really, really contemplate on what the role of the agent should be and here we actually uh, uh, experimented with the robots, uh, different roles. So, so there were three roles of the robot. The first role of the robot was uh, just being there, having a presence, but as a bystander, the robot was main, robot's job was mainly just observing the interaction between the parent and the child. And then the active role of the, of the robot, we designed two models. So one is a, a model that where the robot is directly asking question either to the child or the parent. So the idea there was the robot was trying to show examples of good questions can, that can be asked during story time, thereby 
we wanted the child to kind of get an idea of all the types of questions and the way to kind of follow up with the child's response uh, when they are interacting with children using a storybook. And then the most subtle role the robot took was making suggestions. So the, the agent made suggestion to, to the dyad to kind of uh, discuss about certain topics, thereby just prompting them to engage and initiate their own conversation around the, the, the suggested topic. Um, so we sent them HGBO station. So this was during the pandemics uh, uh, just last year. So we had sent them a, a, a GBO station as pictured here to every home. And then our students, so Willie and Sharifa, like logged in to the sessions and kind of watched over their sessions. And this study was a teleoperated study to determine when the correct time is to ask certain questions, but also to annotate at the same time of the interactions when the child is responding, the parent is speaking and things like that. So in the end, this was also a pilot study, but at the same time, it was a, it was a data collection of a triadic interaction. So before going to the videos, um, I'll just like go through our current plans of analysis and future work. So here, uh, we actually just from running this study and, and, and just observing the interactions, we gained a lot of insight into how parents engage with their children. And especially when the parents' first language isn't English, we saw a lot of difference in their interaction strategy. Um, so from this point on, we're trying to analyze this data on also making association to their uh, demographic profile and survey profile. Um, to their actual behavior and engaging in the story time together. And the future work will be developing a personalized agent policy for each pair uh, that the robot can provide, you know, for, for example, at the, at the beginning, some parents might need more of robust di direct question asking to get more examples of how to engage with their children. Um, but then over time, the robot may uh, increase more suggestions versus direct question asking, right? So, and so we're trying to develop personalized policies on how to balance those robust roles based on specific child and parent pair. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Meredith Thompson. I'm a research scientist at the Education Arcade, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Cellverse, which is a game um, where you're, we learn about cell biology through virtual reality. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the game. I'll share a little bit about our publications, um, talk a little bit about our studies, and then talk about some design principles. Um, so the goal of Cellverse is to learn cell biology. It's collaborative, so it's both VR and tablet-based. And um, the audience is high school students initially, but we realize that there's an audience even beyond high school students for this game. So I wanted to show you a little bit of this game, and uh, it's only a minute, and I think it's pretty entertaining. was a game where you're inside of a cell and the, the premise is that the cell has a type of cystic fibrosis and your goal to figure out what type it is in order to cure um, a student who has cystic fibrosis. And so one of the things that we've done a lot is we did um, a lot of not only studies but publishing throughout the study 
um, throughout the project. We started out with design and user testing studies. We did a bunch of qualitative um, publishing on a couple of qualitative studies on quantitative studies. And we also have kind of a, a summary document that um, summarizes what we learned over the entire project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the different studies. Um, we did a user study of about 60 people. We involved subject matter experts. For example, Ian Cheeseman, who is quoted in the trailer, was one of the people who tried the game out early on and gave us feedback on it. And what we found is that subject matter experts can be helpful and that iterative design cycles improve the game. We did um, a qualitative study of um, eight dyads in 2018 and, um, oh, sorry, and, and, and we had a, a couple of qualitative studies, that's why the end is 26, but I'm going to talk about the eight dyads. And we learned that better subject knowledge um, leads to more location awareness within the game, and that the navigator, the person who's in VR, can take the explorer's, the, sorry, the navigator, the person on the tablet, can take the explorer's viewpoint, the person who's in the VR. And um, so it's easier for the navigator to to kind of take another perspective than it is for the um, explorer. So what this does is it helps with collaboration because if you give people different um, types of information, they're more likely to need to have interdependence and need to collaborate with each other. Um, we did a quantitative study in two local high schools that are both urban high schools and highly diverse. We found that um, the VR game improved players' ideas about the cell environment and processes and made an abstract concept like cells a hands-on concept. One of the students mentioned that they actually had to pay attention because you have to reach the goal and finish the game. And um, we also saw that students' post drawings of cells were more complex and detailed than their pre drawings. Finally, um, during the pandemic or just before the pandemic, we did a quantitative randomized control trial where we compared a virtual reality and 2D view of the same game. One of the, the things about a lot of the VR uh, studies is that they're, they, they compare um, something that's very un interactive with something that's very interactive. So a PowerPoint to a VR um, situation. And so we wanted to compare the same game, same interactivity with VR versus two dimensional view. We found that VR improved um, people's understanding of cell processes and cell environments, that the VR view um, led to higher content gains than the 2D and that the VR supported spatial awareness. Um, so I mentioned that we have a kind of a lessons learned and best practices and it's at this tiny URL, VR cells. And um, one of the things we learned is that um, biology goes along even if you're pro even during the project. And so um, that, that um, kind of af affected our project. But our next steps is to look at collaboration in VR and learning spatial skills, because they're very important um, for, for STEM learning and for everyday navigation. And here's the team. And I wanted to thank you very much. There's my five. I'll give John a, a chance to make any closing remarks, including some news that we have coming out in February. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks to the fantastic researchers and the huge amount of creativity and energy and accomplishment that we saw today. Thanks to Sanjay Sarma and others. Uh, there will be a new round of funding uh, in February that's anticipated. And so uh, the, the terrific work that was reported today and shared today you know, has inspired uh, continued support uh, to uh, allow more research about learning and education to, to proceed. So thank you very much, not only for sharing uh, with us the amazing work you've done, but sort of for inspiring funding sources to continue to support that kind of work. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a double win, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.